Christ, how could we have known a year ago when the uh, committee and council said, we've got to have the joy of worshiping together at the conference grounds again next year. Do it again. How could we have known then that last week and what we are hearing and seeing on the news all about Israel and the terror group Hamas would happen and virtually sap the joy right out of our lives for the past eight days or so. How could I have known about a month or two ago when, when, when I chose to preach on joy as the lead into the joyous partaking of the Supper of the Lord here together? How could I have known about the brutal violence that went on and continues in the Middle East for the last week and how as a bystander like you, watching television reports half a world away, how it would worry and weary the joy right out of my life, and I'm sure yours as well. And how can we presently know, how can we presently know how to even hear God's gospel good news of great joy in the sermon and partake of God's heavenly food, buoyant with joy, as we receive the sacrament, how can we presently receive those gifts from God when the images we have seen and the knowledge we have dwelt on and lamented have put such large obstacles to joy in our way? I was going to begin the sermon with perhaps a cute or funny story of how we clear obstacles like snow out of the way from our driveways and sidewalks in winter, or like, a, like an offensive line clears the way for the running back to make a first down. I was going to maybe do that, or start the sermon with those iconic and uh, unforgettable words by Johnny Nash, I can see clearly now the rain is gone. I can see all obstacles in my way. Gone are the dark clouds that had me blind. It's going to be a bright, bright, sunshiny day. But it's not, is it? It's mostly cloudy here the last days, says the weather forecast. But here's not the place we're thinking about, is it? Israel, Gaza, Middle East where there are all kinds of obstacles to certainly peace, but also to joy, definitely. And worse yet, those obstacles to joy that we are seeing and hearing about half a world away that loom large in the way on our paths, those aren't even all the obstacles we face. We also come here with our own joy obstacles, pain, sickness, grief, brokenness, worry, job loss, fear, diagnoses. Besides the Middle East, these obstacles and others like them are, are in our paths as well. How do we clear the way for joy today? With all these obstacles in our way to joy, our our personal issues and the global ones. They are all robbers of joy. So how do we remove the obstacles? The truth is, of course, we can't. Only God can. So perhaps recounting God's basic gospel good news that he has for us will go a long way today to us seeing him remove the obstacles to joy from our grim outlook on life these days and in enabling us to find joy in what is at best, this time, our own skeptical search for some tiny joy morsels in the supper. Maybe God's intention is to lay before us a feast of joy, even though we'll be expecting so, so much less. This is a Trinitarian message, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. What obstacles to joy for us do each of them, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, blast right through for us? What roadblocks do they take out of our way so we can discover God's gift of joy? The first obstacle to the basic gospel good news 
is this. Works righteousness. Works righteousness blocks our joy. I don't feel forgiven because I do so much that's wrong. I sin a lot. I sin more than I don't sin, so I can't earn forgiveness. I'm not working my way into heaven. I'm going backwards, in fact. I'm not earning my salvation. I'm not becoming friends with God because I can't stop sinning. Doing righteousness is supposed to make me right with God, and surely that will bring me joy. But I'm a miserable failure at it, at works righteousness. That's a roadblock to joy. But our Father in heaven has blasted through that obstacle. Our Father in heaven has given us all reason to rejoice because instead of works righteousness, he gives us Christ's righteousness and so forgives our sin. The Father forgives our sins. The good news is it's not up to us to forgive our sins. It's not up to us to pull ourselves back into friendship with God. It's not up to us to earn his forgiveness by doing more good things than bad things. That's not how it works. The Father sent the Son to die for us while we were still sinners. Christ loved us, gave himself up for us. Romans 5, 8. And the Father, because of his Son's work on the cross forgives us. So that 1 John 1 verse 9 is proved right. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will purify us from all unrighteousness. God the Father forgives us from our sin. We don't have to pay for it, work for it, do more righteous things than bad things for it, earn our way to becoming friends with him. God the Father forgives us. And the obstacle we often impose on ourselves, works righteousness, is blasted right out of the way. We ought to find joy in that. Just, for example, remember King David having lusted, committed adultery, murdered. His sin is brought to his attention by Nathan the prophet and David's words of confession, I have sinned against the Lord, are followed immediately by God's words of assurance. The Lord has taken away your sin. In Psalm 51, David confesses this sin in poetry. Cleanse me with hyssop and I'll be clean. Wash me and I'll be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Simple confession of sin, not impossible works righteousness. Psalm 103, the Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He does not treat us as our sins deserve. King David knew it so well. Or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions, our sins from us. Beloved, the Father forgives our sins. We don't do it. We can't earn it. We can't do it. For some made-up idea that that to be with God, we need our good things to outnumber our bad things. No, thinking that way is an obstacle to joy. God the Father forgives our sin, and they're gone. The sins are gone. They won't block our way into heaven because he removes them. The good news is you didn't have to earn your sins' forgiveness. The Father simply forgave you. You recount that truth and look what greets you on your path on the way. It is joy. The second obstacle to the basic gospel good news is this. And and it looms before us. I may receive forgiveness as a gift from God the Father, but you know what? I still feel guilty. I still feel the guilt that must still be in here. I still have all those guilt feelings related to my sin. And they go on and on for years sometimes. Those guilt feelings are a roadblock to joy. But our Savior Jesus, the Son of God, has blasted through that obstacle. God's own Son has given us all reason to rejoice because instead of those guilt feelings, the Word of God tells us that the Son of God removes our guilt. Psalm 32, verses 3 through 5. 
speak of this. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. Guilt, guilt, guilt. Guilt feelings, guilt feelings. Feel guilty, feel guilty. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Did you hear it? The good news is that the guilt is gone. Christ, the Son of God, took our guilt for sin away at the cross. He took it upon himself, and any and all punishment required for that guilt. He endured it. He suffered it. He died because of it. He took that punishment in our place. The guilt is gone. We don't have to heap it on ourselves anymore. It's gone. There is no more guilt to heap on. It's been suffered for. Jesus did it. Hebrews 10, verse 22 says to us, Let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience. The blood of Christ, the Son of God, took care of our guilt before God. Took it away. When you come face to face with God, when you honestly confess your sins and seek His forgiveness, you will find the guilt is gone too. But what about the guilt feeling? They keep coming back. What I did, well, you could never know how guilty I feel about it. Everybody has something like that. But Christ has freed us from that too. It's too amazing to believe. But if it means every day or every time the guilt feelings come, praying to God, saying to him, Jesus, those feelings are back. And they're weighing me down. I'm in mortal agony. They are depressing me. They are crushing me. Jesus, free me from them again because you tell me the guilt is gone but give me the confidence to believe that and know that and trust you. Take even the feelings of guilt away because you don't want me to live with those feelings of guilt that you fully took care of at the cross. Beloved, if it means every time those feelings return, that that is your prayer, then make it your prayer because he alone has the power to even remove the guilt feelings. If he can remove the guilt, he can remove the guilt feelings. Now understand this. What I mean by guilt feelings here is, is not when our consciences tell us we did something wrong. I feel guilty because I did this awful thing. What I'm talking about is when we've confessed that awful thing and, and that awful guilt to God about that awful specific sin, and we're no longer sinning that way, but the guilt feelings from it linger on sometimes for years. Those are the guilt feelings I'm talking about. And there's nothing the devil wants more than God's people to be carrying around a joyless burden of past guilt feelings. How burdened it makes us. How ineffective. Give even the guilt feelings to Jesus because he can and will remove them. Pray the second they return. And that may mean we're praying an awful lot. And that's okay. The prayers of his people are powerful and effective. And Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is even more so. Let him blast through the obstacle of grief and guilt feelings in your life again and again. And then look what greets you on your path, on the way. It is joy. Third obstacle to the basic gospel good news is this. The idea that somehow I can muster up, conjure up joy. This is a massive roadblock that I somehow can muster up joy. The good news that blasts through that obstacle is that joy is imparted as a gift. I'm convinced. We don't muster it up. How can you muster up joy after a week of horrific news like we have? The third roadblock to joy gets blasted to pieces by this truth. The Holy Spirit implants our joy. Joy is a fruit that the 
Spirit of God gets growing in us. Galatians 5.22. Fruit of the Spirit is love, joy. Many a movie or sitcom has been made making fun of families that are about to do something like go on vacation. And the father and the mother say when everything is going wrong, the kids are being miserable, and the parents are yelling at the kids. And finally one of them says, we are going to have fun on this vacation. As if somehow they can conjure up the fun. It does not work, of course. And joy does not work like that either. It's a gift from the Holy Spirit. You can't bear down and try real hard to become joyful. The Holy Spirit blasts through that idea and implants it in your heart. Last Sunday, last Sunday, think back. Do you know when that happened for me? At the start of the baptism. Remember the baptism. When I asked for the PowerPoint picture of Ryland Matthews to be projected, and there it was. Two pictures, really. One of Ryland, while just a baby. The other of Rob, Jessica, Jameson, and Ryland standing in front of the judge's bench in the well, as it's called. And they were all smiling with joy. But what really hit me, and I realized it was the Holy Spirit implanting that joy fruit in my heart again, was when I looked closely at that picture and saw the judge looking down from the bench on this family, on this child, newly and officially adopted into the Matthews family. And the judge, did you see it, was beaming at them with joy. I'm so glad they shared that picture with us. That was a Holy Spirit planting joy moment, for me at least. I hope for you too. And I, I didn't conjure that up. I didn't muster that up. I couldn't if I tried. That was God's Holy Spirit blasting through any obstacle so that we could look at what greets us on our path, on our way. It is joy. The Holy Spirit imparts that fruit of joy to us. So, with those three obstacles out of the way, we approach now the table of the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Just think, no matter what the global situation is, even when it's horrific like now, no matter what the inner turmoil of our hearts is even when it's devastating like it sometimes gets just think as we approach this table the triune God who is also known as our judge he is looking at each of us and he is beaming at us with joy and love and he welcomes us to his joyful feast right now. So, we come with joy. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you that you with the Son of God and the Holy Spirit are constantly about the business of giving us joy. And you've done that. You took our sin away. You forgave our sin. And you take the guilt away, even the guilt feelings. And you are the one who implants that joy in our hearts. So, Father, we pray that even right now as we come to this table on a day that, that we have such mixed feelings about because we know this is a day of joy, a day of wonderful praise to you, but it's also a day that many around the world are just going through with such difficulty. But Father, we pray, remove obstacles wherever your church is, wherever brothers and sisters in Christ are, wherever your children are. Remove obstacles for them and, and for us too. Obstacles to joy and fill them with joy in our heart. Fill us, we pray. You are a good God.